my favorite, favorite crop. Business is on one side, the science is on the other side, side. So we can actually discuss about more in data and here in the sense of image processing. But first, I would like to give a couple of teasers. And in my opinion, data is like gunpowder. Gunpowder was found in ninth century by, by Chinese empire. And we have seen good and bad of the data. And the uh, good and bad of the gunpowder, we can make marvelous fi fireworks out of that, or weapons we all see here every day. And data is like that. Data shapes in the hand, hands of people, like us, industrious. Um, and sometimes we really drive the companies to the failure if you do, for example, the forecasting. As data scientists, you all do forecasting once or twice in your life. And if you use ANOA without thinking what's going on around ANOA, what is your data, you're going to drive your company to the failure because you might have seasonality, you might have behavior. So that's those kind of things that I would like to spend more time and I would like to spend more time on the things when you put your hands in the data science, the terminology that we discuss and we forget within those very busy schedules. Juan actually touched the point where he said that he doesn't have any technical background. But we're in a position that the technical background are not really gold these days because you have all those packages that uh, we've talked about you are. We can actually um, use those, but the biggest concern is the data. And a couple of years ago, our other problem was the boundaries between the disciplines, boundaries between the people, but we, we, we are breaking those boundaries now. So we, we are together, we are sitting in the rooms with um, data scientists or analytics people with no uh, business background, sitting with a business owner, which can be a VP of marketing and discuss about the data. And it all boils down to the understanding of, of the people. So I sit down um, with the academician to bring their products to the market um, and package it. So th this is where we are at. The boundaries are so thin now and we're still talking about people. Um, when we talk about data. As I mentioned, now we are in a situation where we have higher performance. We have computers um, running on the cloud. We don't even know it's seamless that the data comes to our um, tables. And also in media out there, there are some big um, CPUs that you don't even realize how big of a data you're running. But uh, I will just play with the words a little bit here because we forgot when we talk about artificial intelligence, the Silicon Valley brought this idea, everything is artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence has different, different branches and artificial intelligence is actually one part of what we do. There is a recognition technology behind it, and there is an intelligence behind this recognition technology. For example, currently, this, with the power of the recognition technology, we can figure out, we can use ITM machines with our iPhones. And this is, uh, this is why we use them from European countries right now. And supermarket checkout scanners, I saw once with the sen 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 sensors, and some breath analyzers where you can actually figure out what's happening with your stomach, whether you have an ulcer um, before even any radiology, uh, radiology lab can figure it out. 
And this is all this is all the algorithm. This is all the recog recognition technologies are uh, technologies that are talking to the sensors. I think Sai talked about the algorithms being old. This is recognition technology algorithms are really old. It's um, it's been some of them have been developed in 1880s, and we're still using the same algorithms. The difference is the technology. The difference is the power of the computer. The difference is the communication between the people. The open source is the difference. And so I, I went to the Britannica. I, I'm old enough to have Britannica dictionaries, but I use Google. So uh, Britannica tells me that intelligence is a mental quality that consists of the abilities to learn from experience. And it also talks about knowledge and one's environment. That makes the computers intelligent. Human behavior makes the computers intelligent. We tell them what to do. And when, we, when I um, look at the recognition technologies, we were able to say what, what ulcer is, what apple is. But we were, one thing was missing there is the how. And there we come up with the terminology called artificial intelligence. And here we, it's going to come to a little bit contradictory point and stop me and chime in and make statements and, and, and ask questions. So what is artificial intelligence? A branch of computer science, we know that. It's, it makes the machine smart, we know that. But what it uses is the human intelligence, reasoning, learning, and self-involvement. That makes the artificial intelligence artificial intelligence. And here, we actually see two different branch clearly, where you have this soft confident CI, uh, computational intelligence recognition methods, um, and in the other side, the artificial, I cannot talk okay, this is here, artificial intelligence, where we get all those information from the CI and then move it to a hard computing environment and we create the artificial intelligence. And now it, get, it gets a little bit contradictory from what we know now, because Folger didn't know that Google can come up with a powerful machine which can do the checker. So he's saying um, the artificial intelligence, the artificial part, they may play, the artificial part may play an excellent chess game, <coughs> but they cannot learn how to play checker or anything else for that matter. In, in sense, they are complicated calculators. So basically, even though we can teach the artificial intelligence, it, and we are thinking that they are going to take over the world, they are actually very, very complicated calculators. And now we're at the stage that we can actually put the, with the complicated calculators, we can actually put the check, check, and checker game together, and talk about data. And here, the data I am having, and is near and dear in my heart, is image processing. I've been uh, working on image uh, processing for over 25 years now, and this is one part of the data we are still trying to enter into the businesses in the sense of, for example, most banks and the insurance companies are now looking at these pictures that they get from the client or adjusters to figure out whether what the, the information they are getting is really accurate or not. So that's a piece of our data now, piece of our powerful computers sitting behind but we're not at the stage where we use the power of that image. And 
So there are three components of the data, useful, irrelevant, and redundant. And these are the, these are the algorithms that you can when you become data scientist, image processing, person, analyst. These are the things that you need to be seeing in your data even before you come to the artificial intelligence or um, recognition uh, part of the data. You need to understand how to separate these three. And um, I want to give a couple of examples of this very, uh, very complicated data and where they are at right now. So one of them was the ground penetrating radar that I started to work on it um, in late 90s. And we were using um, to identify the landmine detect, uh, detect the landmines. And it is basically images, um, they, uh, landmines are images which look like the top bottle and ground penetrating radar finds these images and then tells you where it is and in 20 years ago we were not able to figure it out really um, we were able to figure it out our false uh, positive and false negative was much higher. Now we can get a lot of data, we can create the data all over the world in the junkyard of the military, and then we can actually figure, figure out the difference between landmine and code can. Uh, but um, it's the algorithm, it's the, we, we started to understand, we started to look at the data closer. And the second example is finger critical recognition. Fingerprint data is the oldest data that, that we use as the big data, um, part of big data, even before we had the computer. Sir, Sir Galton Henry went to the um, prisoners around the England, around England and gathered the data this big of uh, 100,000 fingerprints to identify what it is, how it looks like. And everybody is born, born unless they burn or they use assets, they, they, we are all born with the same fingerprint and we will die with the same fingerprint. So that's why it's a very important part of the data sets that we can really increase the quality of businesses, for example, Smartphone technologies. My smartphone is not going to turn on unless it looks at my uh, left uh, finger. And the smartphone technologies. You sit upstairs and somebody comes that you know and the, the, the doorbell is going to tell you um, James is at home or something in that matter. And the other one, this which is um, a part of social works and feeding homeless, feeding um, feeding people who don't have enough money to buy food, is the food mold. So uh, supermarkets throw away a lot of food. They they lose a lot of money, but some of the uh, molds are not really dangerous molds, so you can eat some molds. And um, the technologies nowadays are able to figure it out which mold is edible or which mold is not edible. Um, I know you asked the environment technologies, but there is a community about all these different da da data, data sets which can be uh, visualized. The other one is the secret, secret trappers. So it, I always thought that sacred choppers are the urban legend. It's a very, it's a very lucrative job. And if you get one price to a, su a supermarket or to a fast food restaurant, you're going to get between twenty to fifty dollars for that particular price. So I want to know what is the price of double Whopper from Burger King. I don't eat meat, so I don't know. But I think Uber is working. So you can you can bring that to McDonald's and 
McDonald's is going to take the picture that you took in your camera and put it in their database. But the only reason they use that one, thing, uh, one picture is to figure out you were really in the Burger King restaurant. So you have all those many items, you, give them, you take your money, go home, and McDonald's puts it in their database, but they don't analyze that data. So it's, they are, I mean, they, um, since they can put that data in, they have some sort of power to analyze the data. And you will be the future analyzing, the, analyzing that data. I don't think anybody did it. Um, so uh, you can do the power, that's what I was saying. You can, do the, you can analyze what the price of that particular item and what it is. All of these I gave you different options, but all of these have three, four important components. One is the data, you get to have the image. The second one is the preparation of data, pre-processing, cleansing, and extracting the feature, what the right feature is, and classification. Classification could be supervised, unsupervised, mixed, but these are four things, but uh, you don't know until you, you know your data. Um, so you have to be very careful to know the, what feature is relevant, what, what is not redundant in your data, what is, uh, what is not very relevant. And of course, in order to know that, you need to know what method to use. And here, there are some common methods that I will quickly go through. One is the grayscaling. So whenever you get the picture, make sure that you're grayscaling um, to keep it uh, tight and nice in your database. And thresholding, so you are looking at the binary, different binary levels of the image. Here, the most important thing is like what is important for you. How much you want to highlight the foreground and uh, push the foreground backwards. And that's, that's where the windowing comes. You can use different windowing techniques. And I actually, I was not going to stop here, but I want to talk about LENA. LENA, if you ever studied image processing, LENA is an image that you see in all books. Um, she was a lady. Um, and a photographer. I mean, she was she was um, she was a prostitute, and a photographer found her, and that picture became so famous all over the world. And over maybe 50 years, everybody studies this picture. <laughs> and the blurring is another. Going back to the data, blurring is the, another. Uh, pre-processing technique that you use sometimes the background is you have a picture which is raw angle um, which is shiny and you use blurring to bring the data back to the light. Counter and boundary, uh, boundary detection is the other algorithm you use and you hear in this field you're going to hear a lot of Gaussian filtering. And edge detection you bring up the edges <coughs> and put the intent, change the brightness and intensity of your data. Uh, line and shape detection, you look at the common, uh, commonalities in your data, for example, rectangles, triangles, um, letters. And I put the optical character character recognition here because it's it's in between your pre-processing and the analyzing your data and the, of course optical character recognition is the uh, date te technique that you only use when you're looking at the menu items here I talked and here you're doing the pre-processing that I was talking about and then you're getting something like this at the end. So the common, common point here is, is the steps. Do 
these steps can ch change little bit, more or less. You're gonna do the same thing. You're just gonna get the data. You're gonna convert it to one so, some sort of common format, and then you need to have the similar resolution, and you're gonna need the RGB splitting. Um, it helps when you're doing the edge detection, uh, finding the counters, looking at their relevant shapes. We said rectangles here, but it could be triangles. And thresholding the image, uh, looking at the fine uh, foreground, foreground and the background intensity, um, looking at the text regions from there, it becomes the optical character recognition and sharpen, sharpening the letters or sharpening the features if not, it's not the uh, separate shopper experience and blurring and then saving the image and feeding classifier and we have different classifiers you hear all the time I used supervised learning. Basically supervised learning, knowing, um, knowing what your input is and what your output is and then classifying those. And the methods you can use basically random forest is one of them um, and um, the other others are the linear and nonlinear regression and unsupervised learning would be clustering you'll mainly hear about k-nearest neighborhood or k uh, but these are the basics and these are the ones we are using in this um, wonderful world of artificial intelligence or deep learning. So mixed learning is in between un unsupervised and supervised learning and that also falls, deep learning falls under that category. In, in the past, I mean, why didn't we talk about this in the past? Because we didn't really have enough data samples. Where could, I, where could we put those data? So we couldn't do it. And time, the algorithms were so costly that we couldn't run it. And we also had another problem that we couldn't have the open source. We couldn't open the internet or we can really type on Google what algorithm to use. Now we have Google, we have open source algorithms, we don't really need to go and really figure it out how they make the VL. We have the VL already. But in the past, we had this mis miscommunication. There was the thick boundaries between the disciplines. Now, we, we have all shiny spark, we have Hadoop, we have OpenCV, so all these algorithms that I was talking is in 2 3 wiki, wiki page of OpenCV. So you, if you go and spend a couple hours, you will be somewhat <coughs> close to the expert. Um, and Tesseract is the um, optical card the recognition environment where you can actually go work and contribute to that. Um, I think by saying that, I just want to go back and say all these recognition technologies are just understanding the nature of your data and then bringing this different discipline together together, the different dis disciplines together, and then looking at the open CV or Tesseract, because it will, it will be trivial for you to run those algorithms with a little bit the understanding of technology. So I'm, I'm coming back to this, and now we, we are about to connect these two artificial intelligence and com uh, computational intelligence, but um, still, really, most of the businesses, we, we really need to understand. We have limited rooms, we have limited service, servers, because we are big corporates, we have um, bureaucracy behind it, so you keep your skills 
sharp on the uh, batch environment, so you know how to split your data. You can pull the data from Hadoop for 10 ter terabyte of data, but you, you gotta know how to split it when you're bringing on your work uh, node or work working environment where you have only 8 gigab gigabyte of memory. So that's what I wanted to bring back to the today's world, and thank you very much. Questions. Thank you very much for your um, talk. So I have a here. <laughs> so I have a uh, technical question. So um, may I ask what is the um, uh, purpose of the image blurring right after the letter sharpening? Because I'm wondering, like when you do the sharpening, you are kind of emphasize the shape of letters. So what? Then you know, why are you still doing another blurring afterwards? Is it like counteracting it? So for some. This was that, that that's why I said the typical. Um, that was for the images taken with your camera, um, cell phone camera. And we found out that there is, um, there is the camera angle problem we had and also the light intensity. That's why we had to blur it. So basically that's a typical way of approaching your data that you can change that, depending on your data, you can change that order or remove the blurring, try different different combinations. So basically it's a correction for the... Uh, yes. I see. It's a, it's a preparation of your data just before you put it in the Tesseract. We use Tesseract there, but uh, whatever you want to use for your uh, Feature extraction method or classification method is the last step that we use. Yes. Yeah, also, what are some feature applications for this technology? Wait, can you ask it differently? Real world applications. What are, some future, what are some future applications for this type of technology? Yeah, so the test, um, that technology for the text analytics, <coughs> um, we some of my clients use it. I cannot tell you what it is, but <laughs> there are some. So, so for example, Caterpillar is one, one company. They use those um, little pieces and bits every day. And they want to know what it is, so they, they take all those pictures and then do the shape recognition and then put it in their supply chain inventory. So that's one application. Um, and the other one is the supermarket. There is there is one company doing it already. If you go Google, um, so you can you can call it secret price audit. So that that's what they use. That they improve the Tesseract. Tesseract is an Apache environment where you can get and uh, put your own license on it. So you can get the Tesseract and improve those algorithms and use it for your implementation. But there are restaurants are using it. There are uh, companies using supermarkets using it. All right. Thank you, Melton. Thank you.